So I want to welcome everyone to tonight's virtual reunion program, Perfect Pairings, sponsored by the absolutely awesome class of 1986. I am Erica Plunkett, the class of 86 reunion co-chair and member of the Alumni Council, and I am just thrilled to be your host tonight. So before we begin, I just want to um, share a few housekeeping notes with you. A live transcription is available for anyone who needs it. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can toggle the captions on and off by clicking the live transcript button. Um, you can ask questions of our presenters using the chat feature. We're gonna see how many people come on and depending on how um, populated it is, we may um, use the chat feature for questions or we may ask you to raise your hand, but I would love you to put them in the chat uh, room anyway. Please stay muted unless you are asked to unmute yourself. You can also stop your video if you prefer not to be seen by the group, which sometimes people of my age like that. Um, we encourage you to add your class year to your name display. If you'd like to see more of your fellow alumni, you can watch this presentation in gallery view. If you'd like to focus on the presenters, choose your speaker view. You'll see the view button in the top right corner. Please know that we are recording this session so that alumni who cannot attend can watch at a later date. And now I would like to introduce our presenters, two distinguished and dedicated members of the class of 1986, who will guide you through tasting three wines and two Spanish dishes. So Ashley Parker Snyder is the co-owner of Fest Parker Winery in Los Olivos, California. After an initial career in government in Washington, D.C., Ashley has spent the last 30 plus years being involved in all facets of the sales and marketing functions of the winery. She frequently travels to markets all over the country to work with the winery's network of distributors and brokers, contributes regularly to the quarterly newsletter, and helps coordinate events at the winery. At our 30th, re 30th reunion five years ago, Ashley was kind enough to introduce and share four Fest Parker wines at our banquet, and it was such a treat. Deborah Hansen is the owner, chef, and sommelier of Taberna de Aro in Brookline, Massachusetts. After graduating from Bates, Deborah went on to receive an MA from NYU in Madrid, and later her sommelier title also in Madrid, where she co-owned and operated an upscale restaurant called Cornucopia. She returned to the U.S. in 1998 and started to Berna de Aro, which is renowned for authentic Spanish cuisine and intriguing Spanish wines. Both the wine list and the cuisine have received many accolades over the years, including a James Beard semifinalist in 2018. Deborah considers herself an ambassador of Spanish cuisine and viniculture and travels extensively in Spain each year. I've been to Deborah's restaurant a number of times, and I always look forward to going again. And now I'm going to turn the program over to Deborah. Hello, everyone. This is very exciting. Welcome. Thanks for joining. And congratulations, fellow 1986ers, for making it 35 years out of Bates College. So my story, where perhaps many a Bates grad story starts, is with short term. It all started with short term, 1983. I went to Spain for six weeks with Professor John Mayer, and I was never quite the same. Uh, Spain felt energetic to me, despite her slower, saner pace. Uh, Spain smelled familiar to me, even though I'd never ventured further south than Denmark in Europe. It was like I was Spanish in another life or something. Most impressive to me, in Spain, they're obsessed with food. They compare the chorizos from Salamanca to those of Leon and all their characteristics, arguing the virtues of one over the other, often for quite some time. They plan lunch at breakfast and dinner at lunch, and they may have three separate plans in one day to meet with three different friends for three different noshes. Coffee and tortilla at 10.30 a.m., lunch at 2.30 p.m., and then tapas at 10. They extol the virtues of gem lettuces grown in Navarra to the north and condemn the scourge of unseasonal peaches being brought in from south of the equator. Some found this tedious. I, on the other hand, had found my peeps. Uh, I'm also obsessed with food. So after graduating from Bates in 86, I went on to uh, teach English in Lisbon for a year. 
I wanted to learn Portuguese. But the pull of Spain was like a magnet and I spent much of my time traveling all over Spain, uh, just eating my way through this delicious cuisine. And I went on to complete a master's degree, as Erica already told you, through NYU in Madrid. And I opened a restaurant there and I operated it with uh, my husband at the time from 1982 to 1987. Both my daughters were born during this time. But it was the year I spent getting my sommelier title in 1997 that kind of solidified my future role in life. I decided to be the ambassador, an ambassador of Spanish cuisine and wine, self-appointed of course. <laughs> and uh, came back to the United States, opened Taberna de Aro in 1998 with my husband at the time. In 2007, we parted ways and I bought him out. And there I found my American girl self, the sole owner of a Spanish restaurant. <laughs> And I was scared to death. Every last thing was now my responsibility alone. The accounting, the payroll, personnel management, menus, specials, wine list, PR. Of course, everyone wanted to know what had happened. Uh, the maintenance dudes, the license renewals, the insurance, a website, and of course, the online presence. To this day, I do it as the sole proprietor with the help of 18 wonderful employees. And one of my biggest joys, my stress reliever, my creative outlet is my wine list. I have over 300 wines exclusively from Spain, um, including 95 sherries. So mine is the second largest all Spanish wine list in the country with the largest sherry selection in the country. And wine, wine tastings are my special passion in this careening world that I inhabit called restauratorship. And when people ask me what it's like, here's my most succinct answer. In its best light, a restaurant is like throwing a dinner party, a lively one, every night for 100 people, night after night. And cast in its worst light, it's a mess a minute, which means 1,440 messes a day. <laughs> so with that, I turn it over to Ashley, uh, and then we'll all taste some wine together. Hi. Hi, guys. Good to see you all. Kind of, sort of see you. Um, I think we've got a couple more good slides of um, Deborah that we should show. There we go. Deborah with a knife. I like it. Two knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are so great. Um, I spent my short term in DC, I think, and then uh, actually my short term and, and wine actually uh, kind of coalesced. Uh, I took a music of the whole earth class and I made an instrument with a big bottle jug of, of wine with some different shaped pebbles in it and somehow managed to, you know, participate in the orchestra and pass the, pass the short term class. Um, maybe that's, maybe that's why we ended up in the wine business, but uh, yeah, actually no. Um, I think if we move on one more, uh, one more slide there, we'll see a picture of the winery. There it is. Um, so my family and I have been in the wine business for 32 years now. Um, my husband, Tim Snyder, who's a Williams College grad, who um, is president of the winery. My brother, Eli, is my partner um, since Fest passed on in 2010. But um, it, the winery is located on a ranch in uh, Los Olivos, which is, the, uh, which is in the central coast um, of California. We're about 45 minutes north of Santa Barbara proper. And so about two hours north of Los Angeles, so as you can imagine, we get a lot of visitation up there, which is kind of great. Um, Santa Barbara County has actually uh, been making wine before it was a county. Um, the Padres at Mission Santa Barbara had a good thing going for quite a while until prohibition hit. Um, so they've been you know, growing grapes here for a long, long time. Um, other crops that are pretty uh, high on the consumption scale for our area are things like lemons and avocados and broccoli. Um, but wine grapes are, um, and strawberries, strawberries are really big too, but wine grapes are obviously kind of the most valuable, the most valuable crop. Um, when we started with our first release in 1989, um, we were the 11th winery admitted to the Santa Barbara County Vintners Association. Now there are over 200. Um, it's crazy. It was already growing because it's a great area to grow grapes. Um, the sideways phenomenon also inspired a lot of people, rightly or wrongly, to get into the wine business too. 
But um, the thing the thing that's really unique about Santa Barbara County and what makes it such a great growing region is we have, um, can you, can we flip to the next slide? Maybe the one with the, I think there should be a map that you'll see. Oh, sorry. That's my much older brother, Eli. He's my partner. That's my husband, uh, Tim Snyder on the right. He is president of the winery. He's kind of my boss, but you know, he can only, I, I don't have to go everywhere he wants to send me. So it works out pretty well. Um, I think maybe one more slide and there should be, uh, there we go. The, the thing that makes Santa Barbara County really unique is uh, we have these mountain ranges that unlike the rest of California, they run east and west instead of north and south. So that helps to funnel in a lot of maritime influence into the inner part of the county. Um, and so out um, to the left, kind of the lower left portion of the slide, you'll see Santa Rita Hills, which is one of the newer AVAs in our area. We actually have seven different AVAs, which means um, approved viticultural, viticultural areas. Um, but out in Santa Rita Hills, it's really ideal for going Burgundian varietals like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, it's cold, foggy, damp, sandy, and miserable almost all the time. Oh, it's windy too. So it's a great spot for vineyards, not so great to live there. Um, actually, the temperature in Santa Rita Hills on average is on par with Champagne, which is crazy. Champagne obviously gets a lot more rain than we do. Um, we only get about 12 inches annually out here of rain. So if you have any that you would like to send our way, we would gladly accept it. It's everything is just dried to a crisp out here and it's wet the second week of June. So it's crazy. Um, but anyway, the further east you move into Santa Barbara County toward where the winery is located, it gets warmer, the soils change, they become a little bit more loamy. So um, in those areas, we tend to grow Rhone varietals. So things like Syrah, and Grenache and Viognier and um, all sorts of, uh, of Rhone varietals like that. And then if you go a little further east yet to the Happy Canyon AVA, uh, people are finally having some success growing uh, Bordeaux varietals like Cab, Cab Franc and um, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it really, you know, you wanna talk about climate change. I mean, just in a little microcosm out here over the last 32 years, we've seen the climate change to such a degree, pun intended, that, um, that you can grow things here now pretty well that you couldn't uh, 30 years ago. So I'm not saying that's a good thing, but it's just, just a reality. Um, and so we do focus on uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay primarily um, and Rhone varietals. Um, and I think, is there one more slide? I can give you a little, a little taste of, of, of how we make the wines at Fess Parker. Um, that's a shot of our production room that is the sorting table. So what happens just real briefly is, you know, the fruit comes in, gets picked overnight where it's, so it's nice and cold. Um, I hope you guys are drinking your Riesling by the way, right now, everyone should have a little something because this might be a little dull without a little, uh, a little swing lube as my husband likes to call it. Um, so uh, the, the grapes get dumped into the hopper there and they go on the sorting table and this whole crew, that's my daughter with the long ponytail, tail, that's Greer with her back to you. Um, they're sorting, they're pulling out petioles and sticks and just anything extraneous that doesn't um, belong um, in the wine. And then if we can go to the next slide, um, it drops down again and goes onto a shaker table. That's our associate winemaker, Tyler Eck. It goes to a sorting table where we're pulling out shot berries and any little jacks and anything again, really just trying to get like the purest, you know, and, and just those little berries that you want in your wine. And then um, after that, everything gets put into open top fermenters. I think we've got another slide coming. Um, we, do, we do punch downs twice a day. Um, we, have, we, we do some open tops like that for our really, really small lot Pinot Noirs. We do some that we make a couple hundred cases of a vineyard designate or a clonal selection wine. Um, we do those in the open top bins. We have other tanks with pneumatic punch downs as well. Um, and after, you know, two weeks after they've gone through fermentation, after we keep punching that cap down to kind of extract the tannin and the flavors, everything gets uh, pumped off and um, put into the basket press, which is the next slide you're going to see. And that is the end result. That is the holy grail right there. And uh, then those go get racked off into barrel and, you know, to start the aging process. We make all of our red wines at our winery facility on Fox and Canyon. And we have another facility up in the Santa Maria Valley where we have the bulk of our um, barrel storage and where we make our white wines. 
So um, it's pretty neat. It's, uh, you know, it, it all looks kind of slick and stainless steel and everything, but obviously we're using, we're using French oak and what we're doing looks high tech, but it really is um, actually based on old world winemaking techniques, which I think Deb would agree, the kind of the less interventionist you are with the grapes, the better off you're gonna be. You kind of really let, let the flavors and, and um, characteristics shine through. So that is harvest in a nutshell. And I don't know what's coming up next on the slide. What do we have? Oh, that's the home ranch. Uh, that's a, it's a, the ranch itself is 714 acres. That is a picture of Rodney's vineyard. Um, the one week a year we took the picture when it's actually green on the ranch. <laughs> it's actually probably about a month that it's green. Um, and we do have a reservoir as you can see. Um, water is gonna be a big concern for people in our industry, um, it already is. Um, we don't irrigate a lot. Obviously, you want the vines to be more stressed, but um, when you don't have water for frost protection or, um, or fire suppression, it gets a little hairy. So um, that is our situation in a nutshell. And then I think we have a slide of some... Uh, anyway, that's our little bragging slide. That's Blair, Blair Fox, who is our head winemaker. He's an interesting guy. He was a, a Division I water polo player. He was going to go to Harvard and become a doctor, but just decided to stay in California and play water polo because his girlfriend, now wife, went up to Davis to play soccer. And he ended up transferring from UCSB to Davis and just happened to take some viticulture and enology classes and kind of got the bug. And uh, so it's great. I think he's a lot happier as a winemaker than he would have been as a doctor. He's still got that kind of that doctor imperiousness about him and he's very particular and um, but he's great. We're really fortunate to have him. He's, he's a good egg. And then uh, next slide, I think might be, ooh, the good stuff, the Deb's show. world. <laughs> All right. So these are Gambas Alajillo. This is one of Spain's um, most popular ubiquitous dishes. You'll eat this all over Spain. And when Ashley was kind enough to send me a whole bunch of her wonderful wines, I, I had to decide not only what's delicious, but also like what would pair well with, with a dish of mine from, from Taberna de Aro. So I chose this dish and her wonderful dry Riesling. And it is dry, but there's some fruit on the palate, which for me is um, essential for good pairing. And whenever you have something salty, you want to either go a little bit of fruit or you want to go the other extreme, something really uh, savory like uh, a Grand Cru Chablis or a Chacolina or a Manzanilla from, from San Lucar in Spain. But I love the way um, this Riesling with its super mineral steely notes combines with the sweetness of the olive oil, the kind of mellow, beautiful sauteed garlic flavor and then the you know the snap of the shrimp. I don't know how many of you made this dish to pair with the Riesling, but I hope you're enjoying it and finding the pairing is as, as nice as I did. And I, I think this wine is excellent. This is this is one of those wines you should have a case of on hand because it goes with so many things and it's great just to sip. It's refreshing. It's not high in alcohol. Um, cheers to you Ashley. This is this is a fantastic wine. I love it. Thank you. Um, Riesling is actually the first, uh, the first bridal that we planted at the ranch. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I know, Deb, I know you love Rieslings and I love Riesling. And it seems like the middle part of the country loves Riesling. We actually thought about, um, you know, we were, cause we were really honing in on our Pinots and Chardonnays and Syrahs. And we were thinking maybe we'll just stop making Riesling. And there was like a bit of a kerfuffle um, but it really does grow so beautifully there. It's, um, and when you have good fruit, it's actually a fairly simple wine to make. It's, it's, you know, it's fermented and aged in stainless steel. It's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, unlike the Riojas that can age for, God, 40 years, <laughs> this yeah. wine is, they, let's just put it this way. Uh, our, accountant, our accounting department loves this wine because it's a pretty quick turn from the time you harvest it to the time you're bottling and selling it. Um, and yeah, an aromatic white with the shellfish is really a great, uh, really a great pairing. Um, and we're really fortunate um, in our area because of the kind of long growing season that we have. We get good acidity in the wines and they, and they stand up really well. I mean, this looks so good and I am gonna make this. Um, I am gonna make this. My husband wants to start eating more fish. 
So I figure shellfish counts. And if it's slathered in olive oil and garlic, how, you know. So much the better. <laughs> so, so much the better. So much the butter, so much the better. Oh, it's all olive oil. It's 100% fabulous for you. Not that oh, butter isn't. Okay, okay, good. So, all right. Even better, even better. Um, so move on to the next slide. Or is there anything else you want to say about the Riesling, Ashley? Yeah. No, that's all. Right. So uh, you have, ideally, you have two wines in front of you, both of which pair nicely with this dish. And again, I don't know how many of you made this very robust dish. Uh, maybe a little hot for this dish, but it's, it's great. I highly encourage you to give it a try. And if you taste the Rioja first, you'll see how the Rioja is a very um, smooth wine. The one that I have that I tasted, I give you a whole bunch of options. I actually have a Viña Ardanza 2012, which is a wine that Riojas are great to drink now in five years, in 10 years, and in 20 years. It's the beauty of, of Riojas. They aren't made in the style of like old Bordeaux that required initially 30 years to, to develop and come into their own. Riojas are, even when they're Gran Reserva, are, are delicious today, delicious in five years, delicious in 10 years, delicious in 20 years. Um, and the way a reserva is made, let, let's go back a minute. The Riojas have four different levels. The entry level being the vino joven, which means young wine. And those are kind of the wines of the year, meaning you don't want to save those. They spend no time in oak. They're, they're fresh. They, they show us the beautiful primary aromas of the vineyard. Always this bright, fresh cherry and sometimes uh, dried leaves. It can taste of the soil, often um, alluvial and, and ferrous soil in Rioja. The next level up would be the Crianza. And those are wines that have aged a minimum of one year in an oak barrel and one year in the bottle. Those are called Crianza. And again, those will last up to about 10 years. The next level up is Reserva, which is what this wine that I'm tasting is. And those are aged for a minimum of uh, uh, one year in oak and then a minimum of two years in the bottle. Most houses age them for much longer than that. And then we finally we have Gran Reserva, which is minimum two years in the barrel, three years in the bottle. So imagine to Ashley's point earlier that her accountants love Riesling because it's a quick turnaround. Imagine creating a product that has cost you so much and you don't get to earn dime one on it until a minimum of five years out. It's a very serious concern, right? Um, but the hallmark flavors of Rioja, which are present in the wine that I'm sipping, are kind of this uh, cherry that can range from bright and red and tart to dark and um, a little more duskier. And little notes of like cacao, cacao nibs and tobacco, like really fine, think really fine cigars, dried autumnal leaves. Um, sometimes they have that piquant acidity of, um, Grosella, I'm thinking of the word in Spanish and I can't think of it in English, red currant. <laughs> and this makes them phenomenal food wines. They have a lot of uh, acidity to them, which is tricky in a, Spain, in a place as hot as Spain. Uh, and Americans tend to shy away from acidity. They think that they don't like it. They think that it means it's sour. But bear in mind that uh, digestion starts in the mouth. And when you drink something a little acidic, it really gets your salivary glands going. And um, it's, that's what makes wine so healthful. So if you're eating a rich meat dish, if you're drinking a wine with a good dose of acidity, it will be no trouble at all to digest that. This is why Europeans eat plenty of meat and drink wine and they, they live a lot longer than we do. <laughs> so drink your wine and eat your meat and enjoy your life. Wow. And then when I compare, um, the the Fest Parker, I'm gonna let, of course, Ashley talk about her own wine. But to me, this big, spicy, you know, gorgeous, here I am, pay attention to me wine was also perfect with uh, lamb and a lamb with a, a lot of pepper to it. So um, to me, this wine, the Syrah, you, you pair with anything that's spiced and meaty, you know, it just loves protein and, and, and spice, so. Yeah, and when you get to be our age, you need the protein to go with the wine. Because if I drink if I drink red wine without protein these days, I'm paying for it. There is no sleep to be had. It's uh, it's funny how your ability to metabolize things changes as you get older. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so the, um, the Riojas are beautiful and I love that they are so different that you have like the traditional style and you have sort of the nor more modernist style. And, um, and I, you know, I did, I was reading up a little bit because I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not a Psalm. Um, I, I have my intro Psalm certificate and I'm a level two W set, which means absolutely nothing. But, um, but it's such an interesting story to read about, or to read about Spain because it wasn't really even until the 1970s, right? When they kind of bounced back and the wine business really started to take off again because of Phylloxera and the Spanish War and the Great Depression and World War II. And so it's, it's a really old world wine region that had kind of a major pause. Um, and I think they were like a huge exporter to France, right? When France lost all their vineyards to Phylloxera, um, I think Spain kind of stepped in and they were using French oak um, and they use a lot of American oak too, but it really wasn't until the seventies and eighties that, that, that they kind of really bounced back and they make just some of the most incredible wines there are. So it's kind of, it's kind of a neat story. Um, our, our, uh, our Santa Barbara Syrah is actually, uh, we could label it a Rodney's Vineyard, um, designate. It's, it's hundred percent, uh, hundred percent fruit grown on the estate vineyard. We back blend about 1% of Viognier into this wine just to kind of help lift the aromatics a little bit. But um, I've always loved this wine because it's, it's approachable, it's big. And you know, you know, everyone's Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, especially after Sideways. Well, a lot of people like a, a, a bigger red wine and that's fair. I mean, everyone has their taste preferences um, and everyone, I think a lot of people knee jerk and go all the way to this pendulum swings all the way to Cabernet Sauvignon, which I mean, it's great, we all love it, but you're not gonna wanna open a cab and sit on your deck and have a glass of cab, you know, in the afternoon, at least I don't, unless I'm having a ribeye, you know, slathered in blue cheese or something, you know? So the Syrah is, I think is a really good um, happy medium. And I don't in any way mean that as a negative. On the tannin scale, it's kind of in the middle of, you know, like you've got Gamay on the left and you've got what, Petite Syrah, maybe all the way on the right. And Syrah is kind of somewhere in the middle, but it has it has beautiful fruit, kind of blackberry and blueberry, and you get you know you get those kind of gamey essences, and you've got you know a little white pepper on the nose. You've got all sorts of things going on, so it's complex, but it's still approachable, um, which I love. And and um, people always would ask when my dad was alive, they'd be like, "What's your dad's favorite wine?" And and or they would ask him, "Fess, what's your favorite wine?" And he'd say you know, I, I love Syrah, but Mrs. Parker enjoys Pinot Noir. So I drink a lot of Pinot Noir, but he really loved his Syrah. And we took a chance and, and Deb, you know this too, from, you know, people coming in, you've got an all Spanish list. So you don't have to, you know, beat these people away with a stick because they know what your wine list is about. But it's, Syrah is still a push. We call that a push in the business when, you know, it's not, it's, it's more of a niche item. Like not everybody feels like they need to have a couple of good Syrahs on their wine list. But if you have Pinot and you have Cab, then everyone should be happy, right? So we're still, we're still working it, but I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a varietal that has something for everybody and it's super food friendly. friendly. It's gonna be so good with this lamb. It's great. We do tri-tip out here, which is a weird cut. I don't know if you guys get that mm -hmm. on the East Coast. Yeah, like a, exactly. It's called like a ball, ball steak or something like that. But so we do that with tri-tip with just kind of like a dry rub on it on the barbecue and it's fantastic. Um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's my personal favorite. It doesn't get all the, it doesn't get all the love and all the accolades, but I think it's probably pound for pound, one of the best, um, and for the price, especially, it's probably one of the best bottles of wine that we make. So, um, huh? And in your zone, um, it, it seems to me like that just the Syrah does really, really well. When, you know, when I drink California wines, the ones that I enjoy the most are Syrahs from, from Santa Barbara. You know, I can think of a couple others that I've had, and it just seems to take well to, to your zone. It, it does. You know, um, Santa Barbara County, I did mention that it's getting warmer, but it's still not across the board warm enough to grow things like Zinfandel or Merlot or Cabernet, but it, it, we do roan varietals really well. But if you look at where the winery is located, um, kind of a little bit more on the eastern part of the growing region, if you drive from Fess Parker Winery out to Ashley's Vineyard or Parker West Vineyard, it's gonna take you about 20 minutes. 
and the temperature is going to drop about 20 degrees. Because what happens with, with that maritime influence in, especially you see it, I drive the coast to the winery in the morning um, and you drive, you're driving north up 101 and you take a hard right turn and you go through what's called the Gaviota Tunnel and you pop out of there and um, all of a sudden the fog starts to dissipate and the further you go past the Nahoe grade and through Buellton and on up to, to the exit um, to, to the winery, you know, it's sunny by the time you get there, but um, it, we have a, it's called a diurnal shift. So it gets warm during the day in the valley, but it also really cools off at night. And the same is true for Santa Rita Hill. So that, that kind of cooler growing region makes for a longer growing season, which makes for better acidity. Um, heat spikes are, I mean, well, frost is probably the worst thing you can endure in the wine business, but um, heat, spike, heat spikes right before harvest are not, are not a happy time either because everyone's scrambling to pick their grapes. So the, um, Deb, the, the Rioja is a Tempranillo, yeah? Well, um, the, the predominant grape is Tempranillo. There are four grapes, Tempranillo, Garnacha, Mazuelo, and um, Graciano. Uh, mm -hmm. This one happens to be Tempranillo and Garnacha blend. Normally, they're about 80% uh, Tempranillo, and then they blend the others amount in whatever amount they, they want. The, the Graciano helps it uh, last for a long time. It gives it some tannic backbone and a little more acidity. Um, the Garnacha is often grown in uh, the southern part of the zone. There are three subzones to Rioja, Rioja Alta, Rioja Alavesa, and then the Rioja Oriental. And the Rioja Oriental, much like you're describing in your zone, is almost like a completely different zone in that it's Mediterranean. So the Rioja Alta is, is continental, the Rioja Alavesa is pretty Atlantic, and then the Rioja Oriental is downright Mediterranean. It's considerably warmer. And I've had the experience a couple of times of driving to all three zones in one day and the temperature variation wow. is enormous, right? Yeah. Really cool. So, um, and it's perfectly allowed to blend fruit for your wine from anywhere in all of Rioja. So it's not as, you know, Burgundian and, and vineyard driven historically, but it's moving that way. It's moving in that direction. There are more and more people that are doing single vineyard wines, et cetera. I love, I love blends generally. Um, I like my dogs blended. <laughs> I've had a Labradoodle and I've, I have a pit rot lab and I have a, uh, I have an old English bulldog that's also pit mastiff and uh, American bulldog. I just think blends, everything, you know, they, they all, they bring something to the table or to the glass as it were. And I think they're, I think they're really interesting wines. I mean, I love a good vineyard designated Pinot Noir too, but um, I think blends oftentimes are a lot more approachable um, and interesting. And um, it's fun to see the interplay between the different varietals, so. Absolutely, and the, these old winemakers, they knew what they were doing. They blended for a reason, you know? And in Rioja, the Tempranillo has this staying power. You know, it takes to the American oak um, so well. They end up knitting together so beautifully. And then the, the Garnacha uh, is a more oxidative grape. So mm -hmm. when you, as you age your wine, you do want a little bit of that mellow, beautiful kind of oxidative quality. So you, you do want a little Garnacha in there. And then the, the Mazuelo is a little bit of nerve to it. It's kind of a taut grape, so it gives a little bit of nerve. And they knew what they were doing, you know, trial and error. And we, we, have, we have so much to learn from these people, right? And yeah. like you said, the French, the French came down when Phylloxera overran their vineyards. And what did they find in Spain in 1851? They found beautiful, bright, fruited wine that was perfectly ripe and never aged in oak. At that point in Spain, they were not aging in oak. It was all done in lagares in these big uh, cement uh, tanks. It was a relatively primitive way of making wine. And the French came across the border, A, looking for wine because there was none in France, wow. B, looking for a place to sell their barrels because no one was buying in France, and C, looking for jobs. So all of that kind of um, influx of, of the French into Spain made Rioja what it is today. They taught the Riojans why, you know, why don't you age this beautiful juice in oak? It'll last so much longer. And that was probably pretty blasphemous to people at the time. And very few wineries could afford that investment. You know, barrels are tremendously expensive. And I always love that um, now in Rioja, it's predominantly American oak. That is yeah. their traditional. So their, their tradition, and it was 
shortly after the French left, they realized all their connections with the new world in America uh, afforded them a great supply of American oak rather than French. So. Yep, everybody, yeah, everybody has their opinions. <laughs> That's for sure. And we've had people come out and tell us that we shouldn't be growing Pinot Noir in Santa Rita Hills, that we, we should be doing cold climate Syrah. Um, and some people are, you know, Melville, Melville is a great producer if you ever see that wine or um, Babcock or there's, uh, there are some people doing really nice cold climate Syrahs and you get a little more, um, you get definitely more spice on those wines than maybe you're gonna pick up on, on this um, Fess Parker Syrah. Um, so it's different, um, but it's, you know, everybody's palate is different and there's no, uh, there's no judgment. You like what you like. Right. So when we started in the wine business, all my mom would drink was Riesling and it wasn't even ours. <laughs> wow. so we had to, uh, we had to bring her along, but uh, she ultimately became the, uh, the world's biggest fan of Viognier. So, oh, wow. <laughs> kind of funny. Interesting. Interesting. Does anybody have any questions or yeah, you know, we do have some questions. I'm going to start it off and then um, we'll see where it goes. Um, and uh, I'll start with um, Rick Cagle, the class of 19, uh, 1991. Rick, I hope I pronounced your last name uh, correctly. And he wanted to know how did the fires last year impact the vineyards, Ashley? Ugh, not good. Um, we were okay in our area. The last time we had a fire in our area that was really impactful was the Thomas Fire. Um, but the, the glass fire up in Napa was brutal. And we do, we have a very, very small Napa cab project called Addendum. For all you English majors, you'll get the Addendum reference. We kind of added it on to what we do uh, down in Santa Barbara County. And we uh, sourced fruit from five different vineyards and we only took fruit from one. Right. Um, and we only took that fruit because it was required in the contract for us to bring it in, um, ferment it and take it through the whole process before we could deem it um, faulty because of smoke taint and all of all of those there there are so many wineries in Napa that will not have um, a 2020 vintage of Cabernet because of what happened um, with the glass fire it's really really tragic so um, that means prices are going up too so if you have any of your favorite Napa cabs you better get them now um, but we've been okay um, you know climactically here the lack of water um, you know, we were picking, I think it was four, four vintages ago, we were starting to pick fruit. Granted, it was for sparkling wine. So you pick it a lower bricks um, because you're gonna, you want it a little bit leaner. Um, we were picking in July, which is oh crazy. Oh my gosh, it's, that's insane. Yeah, that's insane. typically harvest runs. Typically you're gonna start picking um, fruit for sparkling wine, like the sec second, second week of August. And you might be picking your Syrahs and Petite Syrahs um, in early November, but harvest was getting really, really early. So that's a problem. And as I mentioned before, you know, water is a big problem. So, um, and frankly, the wine industry is probably guilty of being uh, less than efficient with water usage. Mm -hmm. um, I know UC Davis is working on um, some solutions to that, but it's, it's a very, water um heavy yes. yeah. industry which we need to figure out how to how to do better it's a big thing in spain right now to have a, a carbon neutral yeah uh, a footprint you know uh, to have a, a zero footprint and to to reuse your water recycle your water yeah and offset well, even, even our packaging you know what i mean i love i love a wine bottle i love you know the weight of it i love the tradition of it um but it makes not a lot of sense when you're shipping those cases cross country. Um, it, you know, you could put it in something um, less impactful on the environment, I think. And I, you know, um, I think that time is coming. I think boxed wine is gonna be in our future and I think we're all just gonna have to get used to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that what's in that box isn't quality, um, it's just the packaging. But I think we need to, to start to open ourselves up to that. Great. Um, and from our classmate Barbara Peskin, um, I'm going to direct Hi, this Barb. one to. <laughs> I'm going to direct this one to Deborah to start, and then Ashley can chime in. But um, what is the best way to learn more or get better at food wine pairings, Deborah? Trial and error. Drink a lot and eat a lot. <laughs> That's succinct. 
You know, yep. sometimes you just can't cut corners. You've got to drink a lot and you've got to eat a That's, lot. That was the impression I was getting, but I, I just thought I would ask for a tip. But yeah. you, um, it sounds like that's just the way to do it. Yeah, there are guidelines, you know, like I said earlier with, with, uh, with salty foods, you need something with a little fruit. With spicy foods, you need one that's either big or completely hangs in the background. So my, my key is you find one similarity between the food and the wine spice, for example, and one contrast point between the food and the wine. And if you have one of those, then you'll have nice interplay in your mouth so that one doesn't dominate the other and one enhances the other. Great. Um, and um, Hannah Bell Lombardo um, asked, uh, I know this is for Ashley, I know this is like asking about a favorite child, but do you have a favorite varietal overall? Um. You know what? I'm kind of a I'm kind of a seasonal drinker. I mean, when we release our rosés, I am like that tacky person with the rosé all day, you know, stuff. I love rosé. I love the rosés from Spain. I think they make some of the best rosés in the world. We do a rosé, a Grenache rosé uh, under our Epiphany label, and we do a rosé of Pinot Noir. So in the spring, I'm all about rosés. I definitely start to drink more red wine, and when it gets colder, um, and um, God, it seems like, I mean, I really love this Syrah, but if you want to, I, I don't know, I can't pick one. I really can't pick one. Um, it really depends on kind of where I am, what I'm eating and what I'm doing. Um, honestly, I'm such a brat. My Instagram handle is bubbly biatch because I really love champagne. So if I had to pick one thing to drink for the rest of my life every day, that would be it. Um, and it doesn't have to be champagne. Um, sparkling wine from like the Anderson Valley up in uh, Northern California. There's there's one that you guys probably see all the time. It's called Rotor. And I think dollar for dollar and for the quality that Rotor Anderson Valley is the best sparkling wine that you can buy. They have it at Costco for like $19.99. And it's so delicious and so well-made. So I'm gonna say champagne. <laughs> we, do, we do make sparkling wine. Uh, we call it festivity with two S's. Um, that's <laughs> because I know that's right? people, think, people think we're illiterate. Um, sorry, <laughs> Professor Lee. Sorry, Professor Tagliabue. Yeah. Um, can, I, but, uh, can I jump in with a question on that? I know it's not official, but so yeah. that's so nice to say that you love this other champagne uh -huh. for a sparkling wine and you make your own sparkling wine. So how is it that you will get your sparkling wine to achieve what you think is better than their sparkling wine, for example? So what we need to do is um, there's a there's part of the process in making sparkling wine where after the still wine has been um, dosed with the yeast and the sugar, you do a crown cap on it and you lay it down and it's called entourage. And we, you know, for our own internal reasons, because we sell through our you know vintage and we need to have something to release at X time, it may not be lying entourage as long as I would like. And that's where it kind of develops those kind of biscuity, yeasty, rich um, characteristics that I really love in a champagne or sparkling wine. So I think if we could lengthen that time period, um, that would be better. I think the fruit sourcing that we have is fantastic. Um, and it's just, honestly, it's practice make, makes perfect. I think we've, we've done like five vintages of sparkling wine and each one has definitely improved. Um, but it's, um, yeah, I think it's just practice. That's an accounting issue. You talk to those accountants. It's all about the lease time. And oh, they yeah. don't, you know, the accountants don't understand <laughs> that lease time is what a fine sparkling wine is dependent upon. So, you know, their turnover time is irrelevant here. It's about what you want. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Deborah, um, uh, Kent wanted to know, um, uh, how the restaurant scene in Boston is doing right now. You mean it related to COVID or just- I assume so, Kent, what do you say? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Sort of how, how, how is it coming out of, uh, out of COVID and are things picking up and um, stabilizing or are people starting to line up to get into your restaurant? So how, how are things looking these days? In a word, it is, in two words, it is sheer chaos. Um, we are busier than we've ever been ever in the history of Taberna, which is 23 years now. And um, there is a, a 
serious shortage of staff in the Boston area because so many people had to move out. The cost of living in Boston is extraordinary, as you know, and, and young people who didn't have those high paying tech jobs or medical profession jobs moved out of the city and there are none left. And a lot of colleges were online. So, we, so we're missing a lot of students. So we are, we're busier than ever and have fewer staff than ever. I'm grateful mm. to have made it. I'm lucky to still be standing. I had several months of extreme nail biting with huge decisions to face. For example, is it a sound idea to second mortgage your house to save your business? Oh my gosh. Is, is it a sound idea to um, take retirement money out to save your business? Uh, restaurants are hand to mouth sort of existences. The margins are very low and we're, you know, it's a good year if we make a 1% margin overall when all is said and done and that's normal. Unless you're a chain, chains obviously make much more because they're designed to make money for shareholders not to make pleasure for diners. So I'm still standing and I'm busier than ever and my head is spinning. <laughs> that's good for you. Good for you. Thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. I, I think the wine, I think the restaurant business is literally the only business that is more difficult and hair raising than being in the wine business. I think the restaurant business is the toughest business there is. I mean, your margins are so tiny and you have to, and you're obviously a perfectionist and a traditionalist and um, I applaud you. I, that's a Thank kind of you. Great endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it's a wild ride and I, and I wouldn't trade it. I love it. I still love it. I still love it. I love the uh, the excitement and the creativity and getting to do whatever I want. And I'm a feeder. I love to feed people. I'm a nourisher. I love to, you know, make people feel welcomed and fed. And I'm a champion of eating. I, I, I can't stand when women say like, oh, I'd want this salad without the dressing. I'm like, eat the dressing. You need olive oil. Your hair won't grow if you don't have fat in your diet. Just eat, you know? <laughs> oh, that's what happened. <laughs> There you go. Ken, I was just saying from our 30th reunion, I had a picture of you with a pitcher of beer balanced on your head. And I really messed up by not inserting that into the slide deck that we could have just surprised everyone with your skill. Uh, I'm sure that was Photoshop. <laughs> I think not. Did, did you say with his skull or his skill? <laughs> Both. Okay. Hey, Bill, I think Bill Walsh had a good question and I actually had that same question. So Bill, what, can you ask that? Sure. Um, hey guys, Hi. Everett, actually, this has been awesome. Although I got to admit, I misunderstood the directions. I prepared all the, the ingredients and I figured we were going to be cooking together. Oh, oh no. <laughs> my daughter and I have been scrambling around the kitchen, but we've got all this great, great shrimp now, which is yeah. awesome. <laughs> You, you so can, now we're eating and drinking. You can drink. eat on Spanish time. You're probably right about on time for eating, right? Oh, no, we have to wait, I think, much later, don't we, Deborah? Much later, much later. You're like so early. This is way tough. too early. Yeah. Anyway, I, I wanted, I've seen so much about uh, un-oaked um, wine, particularly like Chardonnay. I, and I wonder what that was all about because I heard you got you were talking earlier about the virtues of oak, old oak barrels and uh, why are we paying more for, for uh you know, aging thing in stainless steel. You need you need both. It's, it's far more expensive to age in oak than stainless steel. Stainless steel is yeah. relatively cheap. Um, you need both. Unoaked wines are beautiful um, when you just want to taste the true uh, character of a grape. For example, you want to learn what Tempranillo tastes like, you buy yourself a young unoaked Tempranillo. Uh, I'll let Ashley speak to the, the California end of things and unoaked Chardonnay and everything, but it's um it's a matter of taste, and I say drink both. You you can't have one you can't have one, and not the other. You need you need oak if you want to age your wine, and when you want to drink something bright and fresh and snappy with that just brilliant vivacious fruit that's nervy and energetic, you want an unoaked wine. There's a time and a place for everything. I do not think you should be paying more for an unoaked wine, though. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, I think the oak, I, and I like unoaked Chardonnays. Um, you know, the Riesling sees no oak whatsoever. Right, right. Um, our Viognier is in neutral barrels that impart very little oak flavor um, to the wine. But I think in like a Chardonnay, I think it adds complexity. Um, it adds structure. You're gonna have, um, I mean, and I'm not a fan personally of overly oaked, big mallow kind of, you know, 
butter popcorn kind of Chardonnays. I like the fruit to shine through. Um, but uh, I think Deb's right. I mean, I think, you know, I, honestly, drink what you like. There are so many good options out there. Um, and to, you know, feel like you have to have Chardonnay for somebody. I love having, we have people over and we serve everything but Fess Parker wine. And they're like, what? I'm like, oh my God, do you think we drink this all the time? No, we're like always, you know, trying different things. So I think you should drink what you enjoy. Yeah. And, and branch out. I, I agree. Drink what yeah. you enjoy. But if you only drink the same thing over and over, you are condemning yourself to a boring life. Drink lots of different things so that you find what you like best because what you think you like, like I agree with Ashley, drink what you like, but try something else because now you might find something you like even better or you like the same, but it's different, but variety is the spice of life. Yeah, agreed. Janice, um, I, don't, I can't see, is it Hegeman, um, class of 81? Janice, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yes, um, in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, they're developing uh, technologies to extract water from air, particularly for um, individual homes, um, so that they don't uh, uh, pull from, particularly from Lake Mead, <laughs> as right. much as they um, have been. Um, and I just saw, just recently saw uh, something on the news where Lake Mead is down 30 feet. Yeah. Um, Beaver Dam is not yeah. in good shape. <laughs> right. And I was wondering if your area um, has uh, you know, looked into that technology. Not to my knowledge, Janice. The, the thing that gets me is um, we've got the Pacific Ocean right there. Why are we not using desal more? I mean, that's what right. I don't understand. Um, you don't have any humidity in Arizona. Where are they extracting water from? <laughs> I know where they're getting that. That would work in New England, but... Right. But they it's, seem, I mean, it seems, it it seems to work. work. It does. <laughs> it does seem to work at least on a, on a, um, individual houses. You know where they're um, augmenting their water supply. Interesting. It's not just. It's not just. That's not their only. You know, way that they're getting water. Right. Um, but in power. Saudi Arabia, desalination is a very very big thing. Yeah, I mean it's not yeah. inexpensive and it's not attractive, but you know, sorry, we've had, you know, nuclear power plants that were mothballing now. Why don't we turn them into a massive desal operation? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Nobody listens, have to, get Nobody creative listens to me. <laughs> Time we got creative. Yeah, exactly. We're going to have to. Hey, Sharon, are you there? Sharon Williams? Yes. You want to ask your question? Uh, let me find it. Oh, well, do you want me to ask it for you? <laughs> No, that's okay. I found it. Um, so Ashley, um, what did you find most challenging about winemaking when you were learning? And my other question, I had two questions, and how do wine trends affect what varieties of wine you focus on making? And I'm thinking about the no Merlot. Uh, uh, Merlot, is, Merlot is maligned. Merlot, Merlot is fabulous. Um, yep. First of all, I am not the winemaker. I do not have the chemistry background to be a winemaker. Um, I barely graduated from Bates College because I put off taking physics to the last minute. And if it wasn't for dear Professor Pribham, who saw me go to every lab and beat my head against the table, um, and he gave me a D, God bless him, um, I would not have graduated on time from Bates College. Um, Blair and Tyler are our, our winemakers, but um, I do work harvest um, every couple of years. I'm learning that I need to train for it now because I almost crippled myself this last time. Um, as, as, as a grunt, you get to do all the really glamorous stuff like shoveling out the press pan. Um, and as far as wine trends go, you know, we're pretty committed to making what we can grow well. Um, and I would, you know, advise anyone going into the wine business to do that. I, if, you, if you start following trends, you're just gonna chase your tail and you're probably not gonna make, um, you know, something that is something you're going to be really proud of. So we pretty much stick to, um, you know, the Burgundian uh, varietals in Santa Rita Hills and the Rhone varietals. And when we started our addendum project, um, the cab project, we said, you know what, if we're going to do this, we're going to, we're going to buy fruit from Napa growers. We're not going to mess around with Central Coast fruit or even Paso Robles. We're going to go kind of where those varietals have been proven to be really fantastic. So 
Yeah, I don't think you can, I don't think you can chase trends. I mean, lower alcohol is, was sort of a trend. And um, I understand that. And I actually um, agree with that to a certain extent. I think though, you have to trust your winemakers because like our winemaker tends to make a little bit bigger wines um, because he wants all the flavors to be developed. You know, he, he goes out and he, he looks at the grapes and you know, if those seeds are still green, it's not ready in his mind yet. He wants, he wants this, you know, seeds to be more, more brown and he wants all the flavors in there. Um, but we do try to pick earlier when we can to keep the alcohols a little bit lower. So I think that's a trend that we, we don't necessarily follow, but we're aware of. And, um, you know, it's, it's healthier. Um, and I think the wines, you know, I don't like a wine that's just going to hit me right between the eyes. You know, I, I want it to have a little bit of, of nuance. So I don't know if I answered your question. Sorry. You did. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And the Syrah is amazing. Oh, thank you. We're going to uh, start to wrap it up a little bit. There are a few more questions. Um, and I'm curious about this one too, because I love this wine. Um, can you um, tell us, Tracy um, Meisenskiri also wants to know, um, what can you tell us about the Big Easy Wine, which I've had several bottles of and I love. That is a very dangerous wine. We call the, we call the Big Easy the perfect date wine. <laughs> it's, um, it's Syrah and Petite Syrah. So again, you've got a blend of two really, um, uh, what am I trying to say? You know, forceful varietals. It's kind of one of our more showy wines. It's, it's, it's borderline uh, jammy, but it's got some, you know, it's got some oak aging on it that kind of neutralizes all that fruit. It's just a really fun, a approachable, um, big red. And when, the, when we first tasted it, actually, when we first started making it, it was 100% Syrah. And then we added the Petite Syrah in to kind of give it a little more color and a little more heft. But when it first came off the bottling line, we didn't know what we were gonna call it. And we literally off the bottling line, we tasted it and we were all like, oh my God, this it's huge. Like it's so big, but it's so easy to drink. I'm like, it's the big easy. And this was like, you know, pre goo So we were like, oh my God, how are we gonna figure out how to do this? And funny thing, we actually have a, uh, a nice agreement with Ernie Ells, the golfer who is known as the big easy. And he makes wines um, from South Africa. And he has a big EZ, but we have a, a, I don't know if you call it a non-compete or whatever you call it. It's very amicable. Although I haven't gotten my golf lesson yet. I'm still waiting. Um, but because we were in the market with it before he was, but it's just really fun. And it's super popular. We sell, I think it's the name, honestly. You know, a, a lot of people buy wines, frankly, because they like the label. And you see a name like the Big Easy and you're like, oh, I got to try that. I mean, it's just too tempting. But it's yummy. That's a yummy wine. It's a, it's a really, it's pretty delicious. Yeah. A um, couple more things. Um, Deborah, um, tell me how, so my mom was pretty much a teetotaler, but uh, the only thing she really drank was Riesling, Ashley, and uh, Sherry. And I know Kat Strawn's uh, mother-in-law has a, has a, uh, fondness for sherry as well. I like it and I cook with it a lot, but how, how do you get started drinking it? I, I just don't know where, to, where start. to start with that. It's pretty vast. They range in color from this color, like Riesling, all the way to black, like your dress. So, and everything in between. So I say, start off with the lighter and saltier ones, which are Manzanilla and go in order. So it starts off Manzanilla and yep. those are light and briny. They taste of the ocean. They have like notes of green almond and olive. They're fantastic. If you work your way down, the next thing is Fino. That's more like a golden wine. They're all fortified. So they're all gonna be like 15.5% alcohol. Uh, so they're stronger than wine. And then go the next one down would be an Amontillado. Now this is getting a little nuttier and a little more full bodied, a little more robust. And then you have Palo Cortado, which is getting more amber, Oloroso, which is getting brown, and then Pedro Jimenez, which is brownish black and quite, quite sweet. So the vast majority of sherry is dry. Everyone has this idea that it's sweet and it's kind of like what hits the market first is, is the lasting impression. Like Riesling, a lot of people don't like Riesling because the first ones to hit the market was Leap from Milk, Blue Nun, that was terrible Riesling. So to this day, people will say Riesling is disgusting. You don't know. Rosés are sweet. No, they're not. Sherry's bad and, and, and 
and for, for cooking and it's sweet. No, it's wonderful. And the vast majority of it is dry. So start with a manzanilla, okay. then a fino, then an amontillado, then a palo cortado, then an oloroso. And if you get confused, call me and start off light. I'll and just come to your restaurant. That'll be even better. Restaurant. We do a flight of four sherries for just this reason, because people say, I don't get it. What's the, why are you obsessed with sherry? Why do you have 95 sherries? I'm fascinated with the process. It's unbelievably complex and amazing. It's a, the perfect melding of magic and, and science. Um, so yeah, start with the Great. light and work your way down. Awesome, thanks, Deborah. Um, and one last question, um, Ashley, how does your wine, um, your wine club, the, uh, how does that work? Your, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, distribution is, um, you know, <laughs> problematic. There's so many wines out in the wholesale market and distributors, you know, they're like squirrel, you know, they're onto the next thing. They want all these brands, but they can't sell what they have. It's very frustrating. Um, so a, a wine club is a great way to go. Um, we have, we do quarterly shipments and you can slice and dice it any way you want. You can have kind of like our charter club, which is a red and a white, you know, uh, quarterly. You can do all Pinot Noirs, you can do all white wines. Um, you can mix it up a bunch of different ways, but um, good discounts, um, you know, not so great for people on the East Coast, but complimentary tasting when you come to the winery, all of that kind of thing. Um, you know, the newsletter and ongoing discounts, you know, for anything that you that you purchase. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, COVID, COVID rocked our world at the winery. We were shut down for months um, and when we were able to reopen outside, we're fortunate you, you saw the grounds there. We have a lot of space, so we've been able to accommodate people, but um, we're doing seated you know, tastings now, which is, I think, a much elevated experience from the kind of belly up to the bar days that were the norm um, and pre-COVID. Um, but also another thing that has not gonna go away after COVID is really minimizing the shipping costs. And we're doing you know, $10 shipping. It doesn't matter if you buy a case, it doesn't matter if you buy three bottles. And that's probably here to stay too, because, um, you know, the, the direct to consumer channel of business for us, frankly, kept us alive because wholesale just completely evaporated. And so, um, it's been a learning, been a learning opportunity for everybody. So, all right. Anywho, yeah. any last words of wisdom for us, Ashley and Deborah, before we sign off and all go finish our dinners and, and drink our lovely wine. Don't be afraid of your food, embrace your food and experiment a lot. Try your favorite food with the wine you think is your favorite. Just um, your life will be greatly enhanced if you eat well and drink well. I agree. And I totally agree with Deborah. Try, try new things, um, you know, drink what you like, but don't be afraid to bring home something different. You never know. It might be a, you know, a complete, uh, complete upgrade. So, um, <laughs> but, but I, I, guess just I, would, with my husband. I guess I would just leave you with, thank you for drinking wine. Please don't let your children drink hard seltzers. <laughs> oh God. They're not, they're not really that good for them. They're not good for our business. Um, anyway, yeah. that'd be it. Enjoy your wine and it's oh. so good to see all of you. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, it, this was really a delight. I, I know, um, especially the class of 86, uh, really appreciates your time. I know you're both busy. I know there's a time difference and we're just very grateful that you were I, able time to- Time difference was great for me. I got to start drinking earlier, but Denise and Lisa and Barb know that was gonna happen anyway, so. <laughs> of course, of course. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for, for joining us. It's been lovely. And um, we will make this uh, avail the recording available, I believe. So you'll get to watch it again or, or uh, share the link with your friends who weren't able to make it. So thank you. And we will um, hopefully see you soon. And Class of 86, see you on Friday. <laughs>